And from that, from that intervention, you will have got a flavor for the way that those involved in maritime policy insist on getting involved in everybody else's policy areas. And that's why they're so popular inside, um, inside uh, government circles. I want to make a remark on the difference between the North and the South Atlantic. Um, remember your map. The North Atlantic is much smaller than the South Atlantic. As you get towards the pole, the North Atlantic gets even smaller until it gives way into the small Arctic Ocean. The South Atlantic is huge, and it gets huger as the further south you go until it opens into the massive waters around Antarctica. It's very different. There's much more, um, there's much more government activity in the North Atlantic than there is in the South Atlantic. Uh, there are not very many policemen per square mile of the North Atlantic, but there are far, far fewer per square mile in the South Atlantic. And that means that illegal activities are much less easy to deal with. And I want to ask um, Armando Marsh Geres now to tell us something about where oceans policy, where maritime policy connects with dealing with illegal activities, and why it's so important for actual and for potential conflicts, particularly in Africa, and what the links are which, uh, which exist between these apparently different policy areas. Armando. Uh, it's how oh, it's connected already. Uh, I will speak in English out of respect not only for my very dear friend John, but for Samuel and for this extraordinary lawyer uh, uh, from the American Institution on the Oceans. Um, I will be very focused and I'll be talking about uh, what John just stressed. Uh, it was good that we talked for a few minutes before this came up. Uh, the connection between security on the one hand and economic development on the other within the framework of this huge difference uh, between the North and the South Atlantic. Let me pick up on something that John said. Of course, the North Atlantic becomes thinner as one moves northwards. Not only that, but in fact, adjacent to the North Atlantic, there is another base in the Arctic Ocean, uh, which actually behaves as a connected lake, as it were, connecting not only to the North Atlantic on one of the sides of Greenland, on the other side of Greenland, through the uh, northern route with the Pacific, with St. Paul's in Vladivostok, uh, through the uh, Northwestern Passage, uh, again with St. Paul's uh, via Canada and Alaska, um, the fact is it does behave like a lake as the North Atlantic becomes thinner. The wider Atlantic uh, is, of course, in the south, where Antarctica behaves like an island far removed from an ocean basin which is actually becoming larger. And John, of course, is, he normally is, absolutely right uh, from my point of view as far as institutional density is concerned. And I would say as security or the absence of security is concerned as well, and as the trade uh, relationships are concerned. In the 16th century, the Atlantic woke up, the South Atlantic woke up. In the 16th century, the South Atlantic did not exist as a political or economic entity. The archipelagos in the South Atlantic, starting from the Canary Islands, which were inhabited, but certainly the Azores and Madeira, which were not, uh, to Cape Verde, which was not inhabited, to uh, St. May Principe, which was not inhabited, to St. Helena, to Ascension Island. No one lived there, or the Fulton Islands. It was just too far uh, for the, an, an ocean which is becoming wider. There is a beginning in the history of the South Atlantic, whilst the North Atlantic, of course, has been populated since time immemorial. Iceland, Svalbard, Spitsbergen. Even Greenland has. Uh, Madeira and the Azores were, of course, inhabitable uh, earlier than the South Atlantic ones and inhabited. Uh, and, and the increase in commercial exchanges, security institutions in the North Atlantic is such that the biggest 
trading blocks in the world border the North Atlantic, North Atlantic, the EU on the one hand, and the United States, or NAFTA, if you will. On the other one, this is why TTIP, the transatlantic uh, trade uh, thing, is being created, whilst in the South Atlantic, we have an absence of a security architecture. We have very little South-South trade. In fact, it declined. It's now growing again as BRICS show up, huge BRICS, with an incredible level of development indexes. Brazil, South Africa, Angola, Nigeria, Morocco, Colombia, even Venezuela, are becoming huge players economically in the South Atlantic within the background of a lack, a huge lack, of uh, security architecture and of any institutional architecture that will guarantee uh, that development is sustained by security and these twin up. Now, I want to focus on three case examples of how this lack of a security architecture is problematic in the South Atlantic and then very briefly uh, give in five different points in which institutionally this can grow up. I'll take two minutes for each. And uh, you have five minutes in total. And we have five minutes in total, yes. Uh, so I'll take two minutes in one, three minutes in the other. Uh, let me focus on three bullets, as it were, uh, problematic as far as security and development are concerned in the South Atlantic. Cape Verde, Guinea-Bissau, non-state actors via narco-trafficking, uh, the Admiral Natsuto in Guinea-Bissau case in which Last spring, four tons of pure cocaine uh, were being traded for surface-to-air missiles percolating down from the Mali through Senegambia into Guinea-Bissau and were being exchanged with the FARC. Under an international mandate, the USDEA intervened. Admiral Nachuto, the chief of staff of the uh, Navy from Guinea-Bissau is now in jail. Uh, the, they came via semi-submersibles using Cape Verde as a stepping stone. The stepping stone Cape Verde meant that uh, from Cape Verde the drugs uh, were taken to West Africa and via Cape Verde they were taken uh, missiles from West Africa into uh, northern South America. Uh, more than this, thickening uh, of this, drugs from Guinea-Bissau are flowing into the American and not only the European market and triangulating up into North America as well, which indicates that there are networks uh, becoming thicker networks, bidirectional ones. Now, the same, I will remember on this first point, happened in the Canary Islands. And that was stopped. It was stopped, why? Because Canary Islands are Spanish. Spanish. Spain is a functioning state with institutions. We could stop it. Cape Verde is a functioning state, a very reliable one. It has one problem. It's an archipelago. They categorically call it Berlevent, when Sotevent, north and south. But if you look at the map, it's in fact three clusters of islands. Sal is on the other side. Although they only categorize it, you only categorize it as two, it's in fact three clusters of islands, very dispersed, which means within the framework of Montego Bay, it'll have a lot of territorial waters, but it also means it's very difficult to control in the absence of a reliable coast guard, fast skiffs, in the reliable uh, lack of airplanes, small airplanes to make air patrolling over that huge stretch of land. Now, if Cabo Verde gets fast skiffs, and small airplanes for air patrolling, it will do as Spain did in the Canary Islands, stop narco-trafficking and stop that stepping stone, which will be a huge blow on the chain network that is connecting northern South America to West Africa. Why don't we help them there? Second point. Everyone talks about, with reason, uh, my estimate, I've written this in the Fractured Ocean, my estimate is that within five or six years, when we say the Gulf, Everyone will hear the Gulf of Guinea, not the Gulf, the, the Persian Gulf or the Arabic Gulf. The Gulf of Guinea is growing in importance in our representations, in our consciousness, because 20% of US consumed oil comes from the Gulf of Guinea. It will be in 2015, and we're on schedule, 25%, which will come from there. 
Now, there's one deep sea port in the Gulf of Guinea, Lagos, another one in the Cameroons, Samuel's homeland, Douala, uh, a potential one in Pointe Noire, Ponta Negra, uh, in between the Congos, Soyo in northern Angola, where the, na the Angolan Navy is, south of that in Lubitu, where the Bengala Railway comes from Shaba, the old um, uh, problematic area of Katanga, as it used to be called in the Congo, where minerals come from. Wolvis Bay, which is underused in the 16th century, it was called Angra Pkina, Wolvis Bay, and then South Cape uh, and to the side of it, Durban. Now, the problematic thing about this is, of course, for coastal security along the stretch of the Congos, Angola, and Namibia, and we're talking about between five to 7,000 linear kilometers, there's a force of 200 Angolan ninjas to protect it, which is obviously impossible. Now, the news I just gave John this, uh, Admiral Fonseca just gave it to me, is that apparently Angola is buying the Principe de Asturias, a plane carrier from Spain, so as to use to protect that coast, whether this is true or not, se non è vero e ben trovato, it would be very good. Uh, that needs protection. A lot of diamonds come from Namibia, a lot of oil and diamonds come from Angola, a lot of rare minerals come from the Congo. Not protecting those areas is stupid. Not protecting the areas uh, and not having more deep sea ports for what is going to be 25% of the oil used in the United States is ridiculous, to say the least. So we have three problems. We need more deep water ports, we need more Coast Guard control up there uh, where the Canary Islands were, are, where Cape Verde is being used as a stepping stone, and we need coastal protection on the south. What to do about it? I'll finish my two minutes with this uh, remaining two minutes. Let me start from the bottom. We need, at a minimum, and I've written this, and uh, John Richardson, to my great delight, took it on board, uh, search and rescue entities, Busque Salvamento. We need that in the South Atlantic. Now, that's really easy to get. I mean, there's not any institutional viscosity making it impossible or difficult in any sense. It's not particularly expensive. We can offer in the North, from the North Atlantic the training for that. The military have wonderful relations on both sides sides of the Atlantic, so why not do that? Brazil is very good at this. Uh, the North Atlantic, of course, is very good at this. The North Atlantic, let me stress, is not only very important, but it's home to the biggest military alliance in human history, which is called North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It is not called the Euro-American uh, Coalition, but the North Atlantic, it bears the name Atlantic in it, showing uh, the centrality of oceans. After this search and rescue, at a higher level of institutional integration, we need, and that's harder, more expensive, harder to train, uh, coast guards, real coast guards. I mean, look at the ships of the Cameroonian coast guards. Uh, they're not up to task. Look at what I said about you know, uh, Cap Verde. They're certainly not up to task. Now, both the Cameroons and Cape Verde are functioning states. Why don't we help them get ships so as to get a real Coast Guard and help in their training? Now, more than this, we need to get them talking to one another. So my suggestion was a regional constabulary, a communicating vases system between the various Coast Guards in that area. Now, John came up with another idea, uh, intersubjectively when the book was being produced, A Fractured Ocean, which is the bringing together of all these institutional ideas brewing into a forum in which all actors are represented, in which ideas are vented. And let me go a step further than this, and something I proposed that will be published in Washington, hopefully, this month or uh, early in 2014, which is, an OSCE type institution that will bring people together to the table. The simple fact that they recognize there is a problem is a victory in itself. Processes of the essence here. 
trust confidence building is absolutely essential. An aggregative comprehensive group where people discuss issues, where all the stakes are put on the table and where all the stakeholders dialogue about the issues. The forum is essential and beyond the forum as an end uh, game for the forum, the creation of an OSC institution uh, is absolutely essential. Now, uh, beyond that, we're in dreamland. Trying to get a SATO, South Atlantic Treaty Organization, not now. What we can do, well, project NATO forces south, well, we're doing that not to great effect. A twinning, Ian Lesser at the GMF, proposes that a tweening uh, southern northern regionalism might work. You guys create a SATO, we have NATO, and we become twins and we start interacting. I actually propose the creation of a NATO Brazil Council to make that viable in the image of the NATO Russia Council. Let me finish by saying hopefully a comprehensive, integrated, wider Atlantic maritime strategy for the entire Atlantic, beginning with the South Atlantic, which, as John said, is growing very fast, much faster than the North, uh, and the security gaps are huge there, may come to surface and may come into fruition. This is my hope. This is my optimism. Thank you. Thank you, Armando.